Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm here with Lance and Chloe. How's it going tonight, you two? Hey, it's going well. I'm doing great, thank you. And we want to welcome our new sponsor, Blue Apron. Thank you very much to Blue Apron for sponsoring the Crawl Space podcast. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash crawlspace. Okay, so what do we got for everyone tonight? What don't we have for everyone tonight? We have a badass. We have a badass on the show. A guy who rips butts while he while he performs an interview. I really enjoyed talking to him and interviewing him. He's a great character and he knows a lot and that's kind of, you can't argue with that. He, he just knows the most out of anyone I've talked to. Yeah, we're talking about Greg Overacker. He is one of the original, uh, one of the primary investigators in Brianna Maitland's disappearance. He is a close confidant of Bruce Maitland. Um, and as we find out later on, he is a uh, close confidant to some of Brianna's uh, close friends at the time. And this guy is relentless and dogged and detailed. And he's everything He's everything a good investigator should be. And he asks us at one point during this interview to stop recording. And so it is kind of a, an interesting moment, sort of a first for us. Uh, kind of took us aback and so we we stopped recording and then we we continued our conversation off the air and then we started recording again and and tried to finish the only reason i'm mentioning it is because it it obviously stands out in the interview and uh you're probably going to be wondering what was said you'll definitely be wondering what was said because he couldn't say anymore without saying certain names and certain scenarios that very very good informants have provided him the information for so yeah at some point he just couldn't give us anything more without going into that and there will be a time where people will be able to hear this it's just a matter of uh right now it it would definitely hurt an investigation so this episode is just greg's interview and it's a little bit different than the first two episodes we've done of this podcast it's just going to be this interview, and we're going to be commenting here and afterwards, and then we're going to do episode four. We'll sort of zoom out a little bit on what we've learned and a little bit more on Brianna herself as a person. But for now, let's roll the interview with Greg Overacker. Greg, welcome back to Crawl Space. So we first wanted to ask uh, what you thought of the podcast so far and the direction that it's taken and, uh, and and the things that have been said on the podcast. I like it a lot. Um, you know, I think Bruce, Brianna's father, really wanted to get some kind of word out. We didn't really know how to do it. So this is a positive thing, and I think he's excited about that. So in order to create the biggest impact, is there a particular direction that you think we should be going in? And are there any particular details that you think we should be focusing on? When I started listening to you guys, Maura's case, and you guys helped me get in touch with John Smith, um, you know, I, I don't know, and I told you this, I don't know a lot of details about Maura's case. I know an overview of it. I met John years ago, and um the difference between Mora's, I think, and, and Brianna's situation is that we're quite sure that there's a group of people up there that know what happened to Brianna and that they won't, won't speak up. And on the disappeared episode, I mentioned that. I just think that getting the word out is enough, is, is a positive thing. Someone needs to speak up. What are your thoughts on the evidence that has been collected and presented by Mark Harper and MJA? I talked to Mark once on the phone and... Um, you know, I think that that group did some positive stuff. Um, you know, it's always good to have people out there searching and stuff like that. But there's a lot of questionable things that I heard on your podcast that I, I don't understand. First of all, I heard him mention that he found zip ties with hair in it and a hypodermic needle in Brianna's car when they looked through Brianna's car. I find that a little hard to believe. In fact, I find it extremely hard to believe. The number one man in uh, VSP right now, I believe he's the number one man, is Matt Birmingham. Matt, at the time, processed Brianna's car himself. I don't know how much 
you know, the average person has to deal with the Vermont State Police or any state police, but I, I do, I have. And th these guys are, they know their business. And if that man processed that car, there's no way on earth that he left a hypodermic needle in there or zip ties with hair in it. So I don't, I don't know what to make of that. In their defense, I'm sure they, they have great intentions and and they're doing a noble thing and all this stuff. I just don't know much about them. It's a big no-no to do an investigation if you're not licensed as a private investigator. I, I was just under the assumption that they were a search team. Uh, you know, they have 503C status where they don't, you know, they're a, a nonprofit organization. If that's the case in, in their, you know, out asking questions and stuff, that's a, that's a big problem. And from what I've heard, that's what they're doing. Now, I could be wrong. I don't know. Maybe they are licensed private investigators. I don't know. I can't in a million years picture that there was anything like that in that car. And, you know, that car sat on Bruce's property for quite a while. And, you know, people came up and, and looked through it and gawked at it and stuff. And that's why he finally got rid of it. He ended up junking the car. It just became a thing where it was an oddity. You know, they got up there and they did look through it. And they did search and stuff like that. Um, I think the other thing that came up was what they had found a pair of panties initially when class kids came in and did a search, which class kids is a pretty amazing group of people and, and they're re really professional. They've had some success, but when they came through, you have to remember these people go through and they search, they pick up every little thing they find, which drives the police batshit because they bring them every little item they find. If you and I got together with a hundred of our friends and we searched your neighborhood, you'd find some pretty strange things. You're just going to, on country roads and things like that. You know, we talked about the fact that where Brianna's car was found in the different uh, scenarios of how she disappeared from there, if the car was laid there as a red herring and stuff like that. And you know the situation where the car was. If someone abducted her from there, it wasn't somebody in her back seat where they, they got her out and marched her through the cold, dark Vermont night where you can't see your hand in front of your face and it's freezing. Not only that, because they would have to walk for, I can't even tell you the distance to get to anywhere where there's a, a you know, some way to get out of there. Obviously, if they don't live in that area, um, they're not going to walk her down the road and assault her and throw her panties in the ditch. It's just not something that's going to happen. The car initially was towed to a shop. Um, it then was, you know, when, when everyone realized what was going on, of course, the police took it and processed it. Eventually, it was released to Bruce. It was put on the property, and that's when... MGA came and they did some searching and okay uh, and they looked through the car. They did find some. They did find some interesting things. They, uh, you know, to Mark's benefit. Um, and like I said, you know, I have nothing against Mark. I'm sure. He, yeah. You know, they serve a purpose, but they did find um, some fingerprint tape in the car that hadn't been removed. That had prints. Is that uncommon though? You know, I don't know, and it's a good question for. For one of the investigators, I'm going to see in the next few days, and I'll, I'll ask him that. But um, he he claims that he found valid prints on tape. Now, I don't know. This is what he's telling me. And, and, and we asked him, well, if you have these prints, will you take them to the Vermont State Police? And he said yes, and apparently he did do that. But, you know, I've never confirmed that. Um, Bruce and I actually talked about that today, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. When that came up, I called Bruce right away, and I said, geez, he's saying he's got prints out of that vehicle, which, again, I find extremely hard to believe. I guess it's a possibility, you know. If if if, if he actually found a hypodermic needle and zip ties with hair in it, I'll quit and start baking cakes for a living because that's just sounds absurd to me. Yeah, that was my other question. He found panties, zip ties, a hypodermic needle, the cap to that, and and I just want to clear up, any confusion between myself and the listeners and not hold everything up talking about Mark Harper, but did he find some of these items at the scene and some of them in her car when he searched the car later on? Well, I'm making all these statements based on the fact that I thought that he said that he found the hypodermic needle and the zip ties in Brianna's car. And that's why I'm saying it's absurd because I just can't see that this Matt Holmberg, he, I yeah. cannot even fathom that he would process a car. Can you can you even fathom a state police processing this car and not finding those items or, or, or finding them and saying, ah, they're nothing and leaving them in the car? That's absurd. The panties, I thought he said he found a distance away from the uh, 
the site her car was located in. That's come up before. People have found pairs of jeans in the woods. Hunters have found clothing. That comes up. You know, it, it, you'd be shocked at the things you will find if you walk through the woods enough. You know, as a matter of fact, there was a case a while back, or there was a, a incident a while back. I, I would have to, if I had to guess, I'd say about a year ago, where they found a skull. And of course, everybody got all excited. They found a skull. It was it was quite a distance away. But realistically, when the police come out and make their initial statement, they say, "Look, you know, there's cemeteries around here. It rains a lot. You know, this can happen in Vermont in an area like that. You, you know, it could be a grave from years ago. It could be a missing person from years ago. Who knows?" So people find strange things. Also, just something to add, I have no idea how Mark Harper would know what size or style underwear Brianna Maitland would wear. That goes back to the whole searching thing. You know, even with a professional group of people like class kids, you know, uh, Polly Class's father, Mark, has this professional group. They're really well trained. They come in and they set up a command station. They get searchers and they go out and they and they basically do a professional search. Well, they're going to bring back a bunch of stuff that's useless, but they're trained well enough they know what to look for. But that's that's the whole point is that, you know, if you find a pair of jeans four miles away, it could be anyone's. It's, it's not saying you're not going to collect it. but Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, I think, because I think what Harper said was that they found, um, and I do want to move on, but um, uh, I think what what he said is that they found the syringe in the car, and I, I can't I can't remember because I think he might have said it both ways that they found the syringe in the car and the cap was with the panties that was buried, or it was the cap that was in the car with the syringe and the panties that were buried, but the colors matched. Yes, he's he's putting whatever he claimed to have found in the car to what he claimed to have found at the scene. We can go back and listen to it again, but I I do remember when I'm listening to it thinking this is fucking bizarre. And it's, I still can't believe that he would even claim to have found a hypodermic needle in that car. Those state, the state police must've gone through that thing. When the state police go through a car like that, to give you an analogy, it's kind of like mowing your lawn with a pair of scissors. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to go through it. They're actually in the state of Vermont. They're, Registration stickers aren't like here in New York where we slap them on our windshield on the inside of our windshield. They put them on their license plate. There was a registration sticker found at the Dutchburn home that was for the same make and model of Brianna's car. It wasn't her car, but it was the same make and model. It was so bizarre. But the person who found it, and again, I'd have to go through my notes, the person that found it was asked to deliver it to the state police barracks and then route to the state police barracks. They got in an accident and got killed. Stop. So... It never made it there, but there was photos of it and things like that, but then nothing ever came of that. So that's just another example of how bizarre the things you can find on the side of the road. It was literally right there at the Dutchburn home. To think that someone would find a a registration sticker at the Dutchburn home that matched her make and model of her vehicle, drive it to the state police, get killed en route, and it got lost in the interim there. But that's just an example of how bizarre things can get. Speaking of how bizarre things can get, let's talk about the lime found on the trunk because it's it's just one of these things right now that uh, that is still kind of uh, hanging over over our heads. But we did hear some really great explanations through our email and uh, Twitter, and uh, you may have a similar one. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Well, there's been a lot of theories about that. One is that you know she worked at a place that served alcohol. I used to work when I was a kid, when I was her age, I worked at a restaurant, I was a dishwasher. We go out back at the end of the night, sit at the back of our car and drink, say goodnight to everybody, take off for the night, could have ended up there then, could have stopped at the Dutchburn home and had a, you know, a drink at the, at the back of her vehicle with somebody. It was the, it was the theory and there was actually a lot of tips that she was meeting someone there. And we, we talked about the fact that it wasn't a meeting place, but it would be a spot that someone could say, hey, she's en route home. I'll meet you there. You know, I got something for you. Or, you know, let's be honest, let's smoke a joint or just whatever. And it could end up there then. And then there's a theory that uh, oftentimes it's used as a as a base when um, cooking drugs. You know, they put it. Yeah, we've had a couple people with, tell us that. Yeah. Yeah. How is it used? It's used. It's It's like a. What is it, a cooking base where they put it in the spoon? I'll be honest with you. I think that that's, 
I think that that's going after something, a real minute thing that's looked overlooked at, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, the car was basically, and I think we talked about this, that car was basically a rolling dumpster. I mean, 17 year old kid, if you look at the photos of it, there's food containers in the back, there's clothing, there's, you know, she's a girl, she's got makeup in there, she's got <laughs> probably jewelry, you know, maybe, maybe it does have something to do with it, but it, it's, I think people are overlook at that. It's kind of like when we talked about the photos of the, uh, the back of the car and there's these photos where there's dings in it and the muffler and right. stuff like that. And, and they're obviously old and people have arrows and circle them. And, and I'm not saying you're not going to take that picture and you're not going to look at them, but you know, see it for what it is. It's a, it's a beat up car that her grandfather gave her that you drive till it's duration till it's life is spent. And then you junk it. I mean, and it, and it had trash and it had junk in it. So my question is then, about Brianna's drug use is is that that lime a, a result of something you think she was up to or is it someone she was hanging out with if I, that's what it is I don't is, think obviously. it had anything to do with drug use oh okay you know, we found out that Brianna was doing more than we thought she was doing as far as drugs go but I, I never heard anything about her using hypodermic needles anything like that there was a, a crack cocaine epidemic at the time and you know, that was pretty fast and furious up there. All the kids were doing it. You, you know, you talk to everybody her age up there now, and they're, most of them are recovering. It's, it, was, it was bad at the time. But, yeah, we heard a lot. You know, initially, we didn't think that she had the drug problem, that she, or she was doing as much as she was doing. And, you know, it's, she was working two jobs and got her, you know, her GED. I'm not saying she didn't have time to party, but she, she was holding it together, obviously. know what the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country is oh it's on the tip of my tongue you have to tell us first word starts with b and the second word starts with a it's blue apron you got it oh my god you nailed it you're psychic no no i'm just a good guesser and also i have a box of it in my kitchen right now so it was fresh on my memory how is it how is blue apron how is blue apron how is breathing air it's awesome seriously revolutionized my life i know it revolutionized the lives uh you know you two as well yeah i love it no question about it and it also supports a, a more sustainable food system we all like that it sets high standards for ingredients some featured upcoming meals salmon piccata with orzo and broccoli mm. pork chops and miso butter with bok choy and marinated apple you kidding me no i don't think that's a joke i don't think that's a joke at all and and you can even get vegetarian options and and chloe you're a vegetarian right yes um and when i first signed up for blue apron and when i go to any restaurant that's going to be my first concern whether or not there are good options for me and i was really happy with the variety that blue apron offered all the ingredients were really fresh the recipes were really creative and it was just a lot of fun it was a great activity to do with my friends and it's easy too each meal comes with a step-by-step easy to follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients and it can be prepared in 40 minutes or less So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash crawlspace. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash crawlspace. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I just have one question about the car. Also, to clear up some misinformation, it looks from the picture like it's no more than 15 or 20 feet off the road, but some people have said it's 50 or 60. Yeah, it's, it's, it was quite a little distance. Yeah, that, those pictures are a little deceiving. Um, I'll see if I can find a better one for you. But yeah, it was quite a distance, which is why, you know, my theory 
kind of it always bothered me that that didn't really fit real well with my theory because I always thought that she met someone there and when a, when a some kind of a, a altercation took place that instead of backing out of there like I would uh, backing and putting the ass end of the car up into the road and then and then going forward that she would do a three point turn or two point turn whatever you would call it and she, she gunned it in reverse and, and hit the building but that's quite a distance. Well, it's a very deceiving picture because I've gone years thinking that that car was immediately off the road. It was a pretty good distance, but you know, if if she if she did pull off the road, like if she was heading home the way she was heading home, and she was going to meet somebody there, she would have pulled across oncoming traffic, which there's no traffic on that road hardly ever. But you pull across oncoming traffic and you roll off onto this gentle grade where the people that lived there actually did park when they lived there, and you, and if she pulled up there and stopped her car to meet someone and they were coming the other way well they would be facing each other so if she did need to leave she would have had to go in reverse because the car the other car would have been bumper you know facing her bumper right. to bumper so that makes sense and if somebody was throttling her or trying to pull her from the vehicle you know and she she's gunning it in reverse it, it's it's very feasible that she would travel that distance but i've seen photos of the car photos that the public don't have that her window was up and her door was shut, which isn't, isn't to say that somebody didn't just sh- shut the door as they left or pulled her out and shut the door, slammed the door or whatever. But that's a big door, you know, those big old cars. If somebody was reaching and throttling her and they gunned it in reverse, if that door was open, it would have took them down. Oh, <laughs> you know, sure. It, it, yeah. So that kind of, it kind of screws that theory up. Chloe, you've been up there, right? Yeah. Uh, in a in a previous episode, I think you said fifty feet, but Tim and I convinced you that you might have said fifteen feet. Being there, it, I do think that the pictures, the roadside pictures that we've seen, are deceiving because st- actually standing there, where she actually hit on the side of the barn, like it it's not directly off the road. Well, you know, there's something else I wanted to bring up that I, I heard you guys talking about. I think on Bruce's episode was about someone getting behind the wheel and and being a tall person and that it didn't really make sense. Well, I got to tell you, I've, I've repossessed thousands of cars, literally thousands of cars. And back prior to chips being in the keys, we would just go to the car dealership with a VIN number and they'd cut us the key. We'd go to the house middle of the night. It was like taking candy from a baby. You just get in the car and take off, but you wanted to get out of there quick, especially in a bad neighborhood. So we take five or six cars a night, go in, put the key in, burp, get out. Almost every time you get in the car, the seat's not where you, you want it. And oftentimes, I'm six foot two, I would be smushed straight up under that dash. And I'm good at it. I get out of there in seconds. And I could adjust my seat in the, in the steering wheel and all while I'm moving. But if you're not used to that, you could absolutely hit a house, run into something. You can't reach the pedals right. And the, the story that I got from uh, the informant I was telling you about was that the person that got behind the wheel was in panic mode and he, you know, hit on the gas good and then he couldn't find the brake and that's why he hit the building, which it to me makes complete sense. I've actually repossessed cars where I've gotten in the car, looked in the rear view and there's people standing in the driveway and driven them through the backyard. You do that and you're in panic mode and you're in a car that you don't fit in and you don't, you're not used to being in. I mean, I was used to being in all different makes and models, but it, it could, it's feasible. So the tall guy with this theory is so tall when he gets in the car, he's so tall he can't get the gear shift down on the steering column, correct? Well, what he told me was he actually gave me names. He told me everyone that was there. And who's he? Yeah, I don't want to say his name. Oh, no, but your informant. You're he, talking about he, your informant. Yeah, he was, he was someone I, t- I took a statement from. He, you know, I, I had to believe at least a lot of what this guy was telling me because he told me things that I don't think he would otherwise know unless he, and he said he heard it directly from people that were there, two of them, three actually. And he's going to be re-interviewed. He was interviewed by the VSP. Um, I didn't, wasn't, you know, I wasn't there from what he told me later. He, he was kind of, uh, he wasn't as cooperative with the police as he was with me. And he just, I just think that's him. He's just, some people don't 
care to talk to the police. Sure. But um, he named names. He told me everyone that was there and how it took place. And that was what he said was that he didn't tell me who got in and drove. He just said the tall guy, one of the tall guys got in and slammed it in reverse and then couldn't, his knees were, you know, up under the steering wheel on the dash to where he couldn't get his, his foot on the brake properly. And he hit the building and he said, ah, oh, screw it. And just jumped out and jumped in the other car and they took off. Oh, okay. He said they, he said they had actually planned to take the car. He, he told me a lot. He told me the story start to finish of Brianna's abduction and her death and her, and how they disposed of her body. It was a long story. Uh, he was friends with these guys. Um, I just, I'm real, I hate to keep hesitating. I just don't know what I should say and what I shouldn't kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, did, but did you say that he was going to be interviewed by the police again, or you said he was going to be interviewed again? I don't know. They were, you know, they, they keep some things and rightfully so they keep things under their hat, but I know he wasn't extremely cooperative with them. Um, we've actually got two people right now who are looking into Brianna's disappearance, we're very aggressive and they're doing a great job and they're going to talk to my guy. So I want to see what their take on it is. One of them's a very seasoned investigator and the other uh, teaches law. I want to see what they have to say about his story. Um, one of the things that he said that I, we could never explain the time, you know, we always heard the, the, the overdose story. I mean, that was from the very beginning. That was from day one. People said she overdosed at a party. She overdosed at a party. And everybody panicked. Um, so if you look at the time frame, she leaves at 1120 from work. She drives a mile, mile and a half down the road. The car's seen him by a very reputable witness at 1230. You know, for her to go somewhere and overdose and then the car to be brought back, you know, it's got to be a round trip. It, 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 I mean, she literally would have to, and you're in an extremely rural area. She would, she would have to drive to someone's house, walk in the door, go, hey, everybody, drop dead immediately. Everybody panics. And then what are we going to do? And they, well, let's go ditch the car at the Dutchburn home and do something with her. And it just doesn't make any sense. It just would happen too fast. But in his story, what he says is that they took her from there. And, of course, the car gets, gets left there. They take her somewhere else to a secondary site and... She passes away days later. So without me, I mean, this is something that's racked everybody's brain, the whole timing thing forever. He answered that question without me asking him. And I don't think that was something that even entered his mind. He was just telling me the story. It makes sense. And he named names. He named names of people who were at the secondary site, people that saw her. He even named a girl that came in and saw her sitting in a home and said, what are you doing here? Uh, it was the first night she had been on the, on the nightly news. Um, he said, what are you doing here? You're, you were on the news tonight. Everybody's looking for you. That, that moment sounds, sounds, uh, insane. Sounds crazy. Yeah. I want to hear more. Yeah. To tell me more about he, that. What he says is that, you know, when she left, you know, that was always a huge thing where everyone was like, OK, if you, if you, if you really sit down and you, you wrote out your theories of what could have possibly happened, you know, you can only come up with so many. So one was that someone was in the backseat of her car. That was one that always came up. You know, when I sat down with Bruce and Kelly initially. You know, it was just so much information. But th this is one of the things we talked about. And so so let's just say that's one of the theories. Someone's in the backseat of her car, which she probably very well would have left her car unlocked. It's this huge boat of a car. It's old. It's a piece of junk. So someone gets in her car at the at the restaurant, guessing what time she's going to leave, I suppose. And she's going down the road, and she's doing 55, 50, 55 miles an hour, and they pop up from the backseat and put a knife to her throat or whatever, however you want to see this happening. That's kind of insane. First, first of all, you don't have any control over what's going on. You know, and the person doing this wants to have some kind of control. You know, she can drive off and hit a tree, she can, whatever. But, uh, and then if he's alone, he's got to march her away from there for miles on a very cold night in the pitch dark. So it really doesn't make any sense. You know, the other one was that she met somebody there. And it was, okay, so there's only so many theories. When he tells this story, I don't think he'd gone through all this in his mind. He was just telling a story. He didn't, he didn't, I don't think he, I don't think he sat down and said, okay, 
how can I make this believable? <laughs> he just told me. And some of the stuff got a little far-fetched. And he goes, I don't know, man. This is just what I was told. And these were the people that were involved. And they told me this on multiple occasions. So basically, he said that when she left, a car pulled out and followed her to the Dutchburn home. Um, when she got to the Dutchburn home, there was an obstruction in the road. When she went to stop, guys came out that were waiting there, and they boxed her in car behind her guys coming out she doesn't know what the hell's going on and they pull her from the car the tall guy gets in the car goes to leave and he hits the house and says screw this i'm not taking the car i'm just going to get out of here jumps in the car and they leave now yeah there's you can punch a million holes in that story you really can but it was wild the that he told me everyone's name. He told me that one person actually dropped something at the site and went back and was upset that he had to go back to look for the item that he personal item that he dropped there. It's just strange things. But either way, he answered this. He answered the question of the time frame that being so close from the time she left and the time someone witnessed the vehicle because it was quick. And, she, and the stories of her overdosing that we heard from everybody now makes sense because they, she doesn't have to be in that quick time frame. You see what I'm saying? I was just wondering if throughout your communication with your informant, if he or she has ever given you any reason to doubt their story or if something didn't add up. Well, uh, he wasn't from that area. He had moved there was trying to make a go of it. He'd been there for a while. He met these guys, spent time with them. Wasn't buddies of them. I mean, he didn't, uh, you know, go to their house for coffee and things like that. But he did actually go to one of them's house a few times to drop stuff off, things like that. He spoke to his kid, knew his kid. He has been in trouble a few times. Um, drugs. Um I don't know. I mean, I, that's why I've got this other really seasoned investigator that's going to go up there and talk to him, two of them. But, you know, he just said a lot of things that uh, that made a whole lot of sense. And he, he even tried to back up some of his story by saying, I don't remember what the dates are, but if you looked up this particular incident, it was that day. So he gave us kind of things to work with. And the story thickened. I mean, he, he actually went on to say how she passed away, where she was taken, and where she is. Where, uh, where is she? Well, it's on private property, or obviously people were, I would have, would have gone and looked. <laughs> what, what, how, like how private? How private can that be? Personal property. It's property you can't go on. I don't know how much I should say about that, but... Can I ask a quick question? Sure. How long into your investigation did you? Well, I want to hear. I want to um, hear his answer. <laughs> no, this is this will. I think this might help the answer. <laughs> okay. How long was it into your investigation before you realized this property was a prime location for her to be? Can you stop recording? Actually. Oh, um, I, I can, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're back after Greg asked to talk to us off the air. Um, Greg's still here. We're all here. We're uh, we're really not sure where to take this uh, right now. So, what, what, how are you guys feeling? I'm feeling like I'm looking at the rest of the questions that we planned on asking, and a lot of them seem pretty irrelevant at this point. That information, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I mean, up until this point, we've been talking about her leaving work, where her car was found, whether it was a drug overdose, this or that. And, and what we just heard was enough 
where Greg had to ask you, Tim, are you okay? You still look like you have a headache there, Tim. <laughs> You're not going to sleep tonight, are you? <laughs> I I just, um, well, like we were saying, like I don't even know what to, what to say, um, where, where to go from it's, here. It's, it's too much. It's too much information. I mean, is it worth asking just some of our follow-up questions, just loose ends from Bruce's interview while we have him? Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's tough to digest uh, everything in, in totality yeah. that, that we just learned. So yeah. let's, uh, let's throw out a few more questions and, uh, and see if we have the energy to, to continue it all. So we know that Brianna stayed with several friends and two boyfriends after she moved out of her parents' home. In your opinion, do you think that any of these people have any significance in Brianna's disappearance? We don't really know. I mean, she was kind of out on her own. Um, there were actually instances where we found out that she was had slept in her car. But she was going from friend to friend for a time. Um, most were very good friends, and they were trying to help her. Um, but no one that ever came up that was looked at as having been a part of it of the abduction or her her being missing i should say do you have the names of these people no i wouldn't you know what i wouldn't bring it up either i wouldn't say their names just because if they're you know if it's somebody that really doesn't have anything to do with it or wasn't believed to have something to do with it i don't think it's fair to put their name out there you know it's just not fair for them to have their name on a podcast Right, and that's that's totally fair because as much as you want to see a conclusion to this, you can't just have the names of people out there who had nothing to do with it, and and suddenly their lives might be ruined because of it. You know, that's it's the case with almost everything. I mean, I've like what we just talked about off air. I could give you a ton of names, but I, I can't do that. I mean, I don't think my brain could process it right now. <laughs> yeah, I I don't want to get sued either, but. Um, <laughs> Speaking of names, do you remember the name of Brianna's other boyfriend, the one that's not James Robita? I do have it in my notes. I know who you're referring to. Um, and it was just found to be that he was just a good kid. Oh, okay, cool. So he does have a name. He, he does exist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. And, you know, James, she dated on and off. Um you know they're friends. They grew up together. I don't. I, I don't think. I think that a lot was made out of that because he saw the car, obviously. And we talked about that too when I was on before. You know, everyone thought how highly suspicious that was that he saw the car and he just drove away. Well, he had some pretty reasonable explanations for that, and the and the police did talk to him at, at length. So, okay, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, based on what you stated while we weren't recording i mean james is a friggin saint right now in my head yeah i th- it, there's so much information there's so much stuff you can't really talk about it and you know there's i'm sure there's stuff that the the vsp know that knows that you know they're just not going to talk about i just uh i guess the only thing i'm still kind of confused about is is um like the, the money, the that aspect. Like we, so we know Brianna didn't have that money to lend, uh, you know, a couple grand to to lend, but she could potentially put someone in contact, and so that's kind of what happened. Yeah, that was a, that was another you know tip we got, story we got from somebody that said, yeah, she didn't have the money, but someone asked her to to get drugs from Ramon Ryan's, and that she. She gave him the money, went to pick up the drugs, and he just said, pretty much, go to hell. And what are you going to do at that point? She just got ripped off by a drug dealer, and that she confronted him, and, and that there was an altercation there. And that's why the, that's that's what was thought to start the animosity between those two. You know, if you look at Ryan's and Jackson discussing Brianna, you know, they always claimed that they didn't know Brianna, or they had, they'd see her around, or they saw her at a party or something like that. And it, it, just so you know, that's complete and utter bullshit. These guys knew her, and they knew her well. Um, I can put them together one-on-one, where people walked in, and they were together, just the two of them. Um, there was actually an incident where Brianna, now that big old car she had, came roaring down a country road, and Waylon, Brianna's brother, sat there and watched her go tearing past the house, and uh, Jackson and Ryan's were in a car behind her, tearing after her. So they knew her. They, they won't admit it. And as long as they keep their mouth shut and they stick to that story, there's not much you can do about it. I mean, you can prove them wrong, but that doesn't prove much. Right, right. 
So is then 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 there should be this other person out there, right? Who who got beat for the the money essentially? Yeah. You know, it's it, there's a at the time I don't know what now, but at the time it was just a huge drug culture up there. I mean, huge crack epidemic. You know, like I said, if you go up there and you talk to Brianna's friends now, you'd be hard pressed to find one that wasn't doing drugs or didn't doesn't have some, some kind of recovery issue going on now. I was fortunate enough to meet one girl who's a real sweetheart, who's a friend of Brianna's, and uh, really loved her a lot. And she's doing really well. She's actually an ICU nurse, and um, just got married, I believe. She's helped out a lot, and she, you know, gave us a good perspective on Brianna and stuff like that. But you know, she, she even says, you know, most of the people up there, most of the kids up there at the time, just went to ruins over this. It's kind of like looking at the heroin epidemic now. There are some interesting things, like Jackson ended up. You know, I don't know what became of uh, of Ryan's. I mean, I could reach out to some people and find out, but you know, it, years ago Jackson had moved on down to uh, one of the Carolinas, and he had gotten busted for, I believe, domestic assault. I think he was pimping out his girlfriend down there, or dancing and stuff like that. So he's a, you know, he's an upstanding citizen. Yeah. Um, Jorge Soto, who they called the Joker, he had gone into prison. He has quite a colorful past in childhood, and I'm convinced that if he didn't have anything to do with this, if he hasn't killed anybody yet, he's going to at some point, if he ever gets out of prison. He, he At one point, I had tracked him down. He was in a, a mental health facility in prison, so he had, you know, it was actually an institution dedicated to that, so he was having some problems, but he was a very violent guy, never going to be part of society. He was just a thug. Yeah, we've gotten some people uh, sending us messages that reference, uh, you know, Joker references and stuff. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of people that were absolutely convinced that he had something to do with it. And he, he actually told people that he did it, you know, but when you questioned him, he'd say, I was just doing that to, you know, get some street cred. I sure. just wanted to scare people, you know. Yeah. He actually, there was a was a incident where he was at a party, you know, outdoors, a bunch of people out drinking around a fire, and he strangled a puppy to death in front of everybody. Jesus. Hmm. Pretty serious guy, yeah. This must and have been something that happened up in the area that uh, you just said he's, he might have said something that, uh, you know, could give him some street cred. I can imagine there there must be a dozen thugs up in, in that area that see this happen and take credit for it just to get the street cred. Oh, yeah. It's It's a very strange place. I mean... You know, it's like I said, it's it's extremely rural. You know, you've got a bunch of farm kids and, you know, townies and stuff. And then you get these guys that come in and they're dealing drugs and people that get really heavily involved. And it's a big trafficking area. And they know that. The state of Vermont knows that. Vermont State Police know that. The proximity to Massachusetts, the pipeline up from New York City, and the proximity to Canada. Exactly. Yep. This has been the weirdest interview we've ever done. Okay, what'd you guys think? It's dark. This case is dark, man. It's dark and it's close. To, to, to a conclusion. So I think it's important that we do take that extra week in between releasing episodes, uh, gather the information, kind of kind of what we've trained ourselves to do with, uh, with Maura's case as well. We got a lot of info coming our way. We want to make sure we're responsible about it. Okay, thanks for listening. We will be back with more Crawl Space soon. Check out blueapron.com slash crawlspace for your first three meals free with free shipping.